What's up guys, Shindig here with an updated boss guide for the new Phase 3 raid in Season of Discovery, Sunken Temple. Based on the recent changes made and what we know so far. Before we dive in, a helpful tip is that just about every encounter in here deals nature damage of some form. So nature protection potions, poison cleansing items, abilities or gear will get big value here. The first boss you'll come up against is a tall Alarian. Before engaging this dude, you'll want to clear the trash around the perimeter of the room, take the rope to the upper level, and activate the six statues overlooking the arena. Doing so basically debuffs the boss, which you can see when it no longer has this kind of green glow. Now the boss itself has two mechanics. The first is Pillars of Might, which spawn statues around the room that increase the boss's damage by 5% for each active pillar. The second mechanic is Demolishing Smash a raid-wide AoE hit that knocks you back. Standing in front of the pillars while hit destroys these statues, so have your raid position accordingly to remove them from the fight. Repeat this until the boss dies. Next we face Festering Rot Slime. This boss will pursue whoever is highest on threat, slowly at first, but steadily gaining speed. If the boss catches that player, or any players that come too close, it will consume them dealing a sizable chunk of damage. In order to stop the boss, players need to force it to eat various objects scattered throughout the hallway. DPS these objects as the boss is moving past them, and eventually the boss will take a second to throw up, meaning it stops moving and resets its movement stacks. Otherwise, Rot Slime will periodically use Gunk, which applies a poison dot to several raiders, slowing movement. Dispelling it leaves a pool on the ground that deals nature damage and these pools don't seem to despawn. This can be a problem because once you've made a full loop of the hallway, you'll start running over existing pools. So what we found helpful was to stick to one side of the hallway for each loop. In our kill, this meant hugging the inside for the first loop and then the outside on the second loop. And that's the fight. The third boss then is a council style encounter that begins the moment you jump down. You'll fight one troll at a time, with each one having one or two simple mechanics. But the catch is that once one has been killed, they'll reanimate as an undead and join the fray with the same abilities as before. So the more bosses you get through, the more undead you'll have to contend with. Thankfully however, the undead can be CC'd. We had our priests use shackle undead, and hunters use freezing trap. This way we could single target each of the bosses down until we got through all six of them at which point the encounter ends. The fourth boss then is a dual dragon encounter. To start the fight, make sure you're inside the ring, the green stuff hurts. For the first 20%, you'll face off against Dream Scythe while Weaver is immune to damage. However, the dragons share a health pool, so damage done to one is applied to the other. Now, starting with Dream Scythe, this dragon has a frontal, which applies a stacking dot and should be avoided by the raid and will function as a taunt swap for your tanks. The boss will also occasionally fly to one side of the room and use a knockback. Make sure not to get knocked into the hole. At 80%, the dragon swap places and the fight enters its second phase. Weaver shares all the same abilities as Dream Scythe, except its knockback is slightly delayed, hence the name. This doesn't change anything about the fight until phase 3, or 60% health, when both dragons become active. They retain the same abilities, but now the raid needs to deal with both dragons at once. This can make the knockbacks a bit tricky, but an easy rule of thumb is to always be on the opposite side of the hole as the dragons, kind of like you're forming a triangle. Otherwise, the only real dangerous thing is the tank debuff. With both dragons active, it can be tricky for your tanks to drop stacks. Our solution was to have a hunter pet act as a third tank and occasionally taunt one of the dragons. Manage these debuffs, and that's the fight. Moving on to the fifth boss, we face Jamal on the Prophet and Ogum. This is a two phase fight, and in phase one, Jamal on has a buff that heals himself for 20% every second. So we'll need to first DPS down Ogum. This phase isn't too dangerous, just be sure to move out of the pulsing light, then decurse or dispel the applied debuffs. Once Ogum's health reaches zero, the fight enters its second phase and Jamalon becomes very big and very strong. He will continue to drop light bubbles on the ground and apply a dispellable debuff. 
but now also occasionally fears melee, applies an absorb shield to himself which can be dispelled, and uses mass penance. This is a fairly heavy hitting damage event, so make sure your raid is topped off going into it. Otherwise, that's it. The sixth boss of the raid then is Hazas and Morphaz. This fight is similar to Lord Kelris from Black Fathom Deeps, because there exists a physical realm where you face off against Hazas, and a dream realm where Morphaz resides. To start the fight, you'll face Hazas in the physical realm. This boss has all the usual dragon mechanics with a frontal and tail swipe, so position the raid to one side. The frontal also applies a stacking debuff, so have your other tank taunt before stacks get too high. Lastly, Hazas will occasionally apply a non-dispellable dot for your healers to heal through. Now at 80 and 30% health respectively, Hazas will fly to the middle of the room, spawn fire elementals, and cast lucid dreaming. At the time of posting this video, there are two ways to handle this mechanic. The first, and most simple, is to line of sight the cast around this pillar and DPS the adds down. Once the cast finishes, the fight resumes as before. Repeat until Hazas reaches zero health, and that's the fight. Assuming line of sight still works whenever you're watching this guide, you can skip the rest of the discussion for this boss. In the case that Blizzard decides to hotfix it, or maybe you want to challenge yourself, then the alternative is the following. When the boss reaches 80% health, have your entire raid nuke at least one of the fire elementals down before the lucid dreaming cast finishes. This way, and by running over their corpses, you gain the on fire debuff. If you have this debuff active when the cast goes off, you will stay in the physical realm. If however, you do not have this debuff, you will then be sent to the dream realm with Morphaz. Now, Morphaz himself just sits there and casts Eternal Slumber. So the danger in the Dream Realm comes from the Lucid Dreaming debuff, the Falling Rocks, and if you can't make it out after 30 seconds, you die. Now, there are a couple ways you can get out. The first is by DPSing the Thorns along the sides of the room. Doing so opens a portal that a single person can take to get out. But there are only 5-6 to six of these Thorns in the Downstairs phase, so not everyone can take them. The other way out is by getting run over by somebody in the physical realm with the on fire debuff. However, there is incentive to stay in the dream realm, because Morphaz takes 100% increased damage. And since these dragons share a health pool, some groups may choose to intentionally send DPS down to get better damage on the boss. Come the 30% mark, things are a little different, because this time no fire elementals or nightmare vines spawn. So without using LOS, the entire raid is sent down to the Dream Realm. It seems like this is supposed to be a race to kill the boss with the 100% damage amp before the Eternal Slumber cast goes off. If you can do enough damage, that's the fight. The next boss is Shade of Arenicus, which is by far the most difficult encounter in the raid, but recently has been subject to a few nerfs which change the way you approach this fight. These nerfs include a further health reduction to the boss, adds, and an invisible wall has been added to prevent players from dragging Aranicus onto the ledge. So with that out of the way, let's talk about the boss. This fight is divided into 4 phases, with phase transitions at 70 and 40%. For phase 1, have your tank face the boss towards the entrance, with the raid on the south side of the room. Like most dragons, Aranicus has a tail swipe and frontal that applies a stacking dot. The dot reduces armor, so it may prove helpful to have a second tank for taunt swaps. However, there are several points throughout the fight where these stacks will fall off naturally, so some groups may choose to run a single tank, having a DPS or hunter pet pop a defensive cooldown and taunt the boss when necessary to allow the main tank to reset stacks. Split the raid into two groups with a melee and range stack. You need at least three people in the range stack for deep slumber, but preferably no more than three and I'll explain why later. Deep Slumber targets three random range players, dropping green clouds at their last known location. By having our range group stack, we can bait these clouds in a single spot so as to not clutter the room. There are different ways you can choose to drop these clouds, but I think having the range group move in a rectangle-like pattern is the most reliable. While the ranged bait these casts, it's important the melee group stays in melee range of the boss. 
If ever somebody in the melee group ventures too far away, they may be considered a ranged player and then be targeted by Deep Slumber, placing a green cloud in a potentially awkward position. Having good cloud placement is important for the boss's next mechanic, Waking Nightmare. This ability is cast once a minute and deals 30,000 damage to every player in the raid. The only way to survive is by running into one of these clouds, which stuns you for 15 seconds and reduces all damage taken by 99%. Once the cast goes off, it removes the debuff and you resume the fight. Now, a couple notes about this mechanic. Clouds have a finite life and may despawn. It also appears the damage you receive is snapshotted the moment the boss finishes its cast. This means if you run into the cloud after the cast finishes, but before the projectile reaches you, you take the full damage. The final abilities for the phase then are Bellowing Roar, a raid-wide fear that can be interrupted, and Lethargic Poison, which does the following and should be removed as a priority. Horde have an easier time with this because of Poison Cleansing Totem, so if you're Alliance, definitely take advantage of Poison Cleansing items to lessen the mana load on your Poison Dispellers. Once Aranicus reaches 70% health, he'll take a quick nap, taking 99% reduced damage, and two Lumbering Dreamwalkers spawn. They have two of the boss's abilities in Lethargic Poison and Deep Slumber, but unlike the boss, their casts can be kicked, and they're susceptible to most forms of CC. So be sure to stun, kick, and blast these adds down such that no casts go off. After about 20 seconds, the boss wakes up and resumes its cast sequence from before. Be wary of this, because depending when you phase the boss, it may mean going straight into a waking nightmare. Otherwise, phase 2 is the same as phase 1, but now with the addition of waves of 6 whelps that spawn every 15 seconds. They don't have a lot of health, and aren't particularly dangerous, but things will go south pretty quick if you fall behind. There also isn't any kind of enrage timer to the boss, so your damage priority should always be adds first and then boss. Now, I mentioned earlier that you want to have as few people as possible in the range stack. This is because it's easier to group the adds if most of the raid is in melee, especially since we can no longer use the ledge strat as done previously. Once the boss reaches 40% health, it enters its second phase transition with two more Lumbering Dreamwalkers. This works the same as the first phase transition, and after 20 seconds we enter phase 3. Aranicus retains all the same abilities from the previous phases, but now instead of Whelplings, we get Scalebane adds. Two of these adds will spawn every 15 seconds for the rest of the phase. While there are fewer of these adds than there were Whelplings, they have more health and a very dangerous cast in the form of Acid Rain. However, these adds are susceptible to most forms of CC, so your raid should prioritize interrupting, stunning, and DPSing them down. If a cast goes through, Acid will fall from the sky, marked by the pulsing orange ovals on the ground. Do your best not to stand this ability, as it deals 1000 damage per hit, and it's not uncommon for multiple sets of Acid Rain to overlap. That said, I cannot stress enough the importance of nuking these adds down and stopping these casts. It's easy for the fight to cascade out of control if even one of these casts goes through. To help coordinate stops, consider having someone assigned to marking these adds. Or if you're a weak or a guru, using an auto marker makes assigning interrupts and stops much smoother. Now, even with near perfect stops, you'll likely have at least one acid rain cast go off when you have to run to a cloud for Waking Nightmare. Getting back into position and caught up with adds after this ability is the most dangerous part of the fight. It's a great time to use offensives, nature protection pots, and any tool in your kit that allows you to survive. When Aranicus reaches 10% health, he enters his final phase with all the same abilities as the previous phases, but now spawns a combination of Whelps and a Scalebane add every 9 seconds for the rest of the fight. At this point, full single target Aranicus and burn the boss before you're overrun with adds. If you can make it to 10% with most of your raid alive, the boss should go down. Congratulations, you've conquered the most difficult encounter in Season of Discovery. The final boss of the raid then is the Avatar of Hakkar which you need to first unlock through the quest chain, which is the same as it was in Original Classic. 
You'll start off the fight killing the four ritualists before engaging the broodkeeper. This guy has a few abilities. One called Bubbling Blood that targets a few ranged players and leaves a puddle. These puddles persist for the entire fight, so try to draw them out of the way. The second ability is Spirit Chains, which targets players in melee. If targeted, said player needs to run out and get decursed. It spreads to people near them when dispelled, hence the need to run out. It will also cast Frightsome Howl, which is an AoE fear that needs to be interrupted. Once the Broodkeeper reaches a full mana bar, the avatar of Hakar spawns and phase 2 begins. The boss has a few minor mechanics, like a mind control that can be purged or dispelled, it applies Curse of Tongues to the tank, which can be decursed, and has a raid-wide AoE hit in the form of Blood Nova. But its most important mechanics have to do with Blood Plague. As the name suggests, when applied, this debuff will spread to nearby players so affected players must run to an isolated spot in front of the boss. This is because the only way to remove this debuff is by standing in the boss's frontal drain blood. This ability deals a chunk of damage and turns you into a skeleton, reducing healing done by 100% for its duration and removing the corrupted blood debuff. Range players run back to the range stack, melee players run back to the boss, and we repeat this dance until the boss goes down. Note that if you're slow getting out and accidentally spread the blood plague to your raid, you can still survive, it's just going to take a good chunk of healing to do so. Otherwise, that's the fight and the end of the raid. If you've made it this far, thanks for watching, I hope this guide helps. Good luck with the raid and I'll catch you in the next one.